Okay, so I want to I want to get your take on a, on a couple of things, and I, we got to get to this Google situation with antiwar.com. But but first, I mean, I think this is extremely significant what happened this week, and I want to give just a little bit of background on it, and you can you can add to it. Uh, what, what happened? What happened was that well, China has started its own version of the IMF. Um, now we know what the IMF right is. It collects money from governments to hand out to crony capitalists, and in the name of supporting markets and investment and capitalism, it actually just, you know, robs taxpayers and um, and and spreads money around to uh, to cronies. Like uh, the local muffin shop is not eligible for an IMF loan, you know, uh, and thank God for that. In any case, the point is that China is becoming like the superpower by any measure. Nowadays, the Chinese economy is as big, if not bigger, than the U.S. You know, once you account for the fact that you, know, you can't actually measure this stuff, it, it's it's a massive global economic force. You know, the U.S. is yet to come to terms with this. It's actually the strongest competitor in the world for the position of uh, economic superpower next to the U.S. Much more so, I would say, than Russia. So now, China, China has its own proposal to develop, uh, which is already in play. What's called the Chinese, what's called the the Asian Infrastructure Investment Corporation, right? So um, or bank, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. This is China's new version of the IMF, and what it does is it competes directly with not just uh, not just uh, the IMF, but but the the Asian Development Bank, which is which is basically a kind of an 80s era. Uh, uh, J Japanese version of the IMF, mm. but it never really went anywhere, especially not these days. But this new inv this new investment bank from China is is extremely significant. It starts with a capitalization of 50 billion dollars, and it's only going to go up from from here. Uh, in Europe, a lot of the governments and the U.S. allies in in Europe were very very excited about this. You know, we were talking about uh, uh, Germany and 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 uh, England and most European nations were you know I guess robbing their their taxpayers to give money to this thing but they've thrown in with this thing and uh, the US has had a position on it for about the last six to eight months even going up to a year of of massive opposition and the US has publicly chided both England and Germany and other European governments for, for being involved in this where they consider it to be you know, a security risk to the world. Oh, China is guilty of human rights abuses because you know those don't go on in the U.S. at all, right? So, um, so, so no governments are allowed to be involved in in this new uh, Asian infrastructure investment bank. But the protests became too loud and too strong, and I, I suspect uh, they emanated especially from the uh, sectors of the financial. Uh, ruling class in the United States, who are who are basically saying to the State Department and the Pentagon uh, and to the Obama administration generally, this is this is idiotic. We're either going to have to get on this get on this trade. The train is going to ride, and it's going to be big and it's going to be huge. We're either going to be on it or they're gonna, we're going to get run over. So this week, the U.S. reversed its position completely, and is now uh, uh, itself uh, signaled approval for uh, governments to make contributions to the thing, for them to get involved, for it to be rolled into the you know, global structure of financial uh, redistribution and racketeering. And it represents a complete reversal of, of the U.S. position. And, and a gigantic concession, too, because it's not something that the U.S. government wanted to do, but it's something that they were push, pushed into doing. So why is this significant? Well, you know, as we've known, for uh, ever since the end of World War II, uh, the world has faced a dollar hegemony, which is to say that the dollar is the world reserve currency. Uh, it always has been. There's never been any serious challenger to it. We've been waiting now ever since the end of the Cold War to see what uh, what is going to kick it over, what's going to actually challenge the dollar as a world reserve currency, if it is challengeable at all. Some have expected it to, to end 10 years ago, uh, but it's it's not been going anywhere. But now we see with the rise of China and the rise of this of this new AIIB, what what really amounts to a serious challenge for U.S. global hegemony and and dollar control of the world, um, and and the U.S. sort of tipping its hat and stepping away uh, in light of this 
you know, this, this ex extraordinary rise of China. You know, you have to remember that Chinese growth uh, is, you know, running two, three, and sometimes by any measure, uh, sometimes four times as, as high as the U.S. U.S. is a declining empire. China is on the rise. Um, and th so this represents a, a huge concession on the part of the U.S. and could signal the end of, of global dollar domination and uh, a one superpower world. And I know it didn't get much attention at all. I mean, you had to kind of like read Wall Street Journal financial pages and New York Times and some other places to even bump into this. But um, I think when historians look back over the last, you know, 25 years from now, this event <coughs> will be seen as extremely significant because it was, it was the U.S. doing something it did not want to do. It would try to pressure other European governments to go along with its, with its hege hegemonic imperial aspirations to the world. And the U.S. had to, basically the U.S. blinked in light of, of the rise of, of China as, a, as an economic and financial power. That's why I think it's very significant. Do you have any differences with my interpretation, interpretation of that, Scott? No, but I have some questions. Um, what's in it for France and Germany and Britain and our Western European and NATO sock puppet allies to uh, join up with this thing? I mean, there would only be, um, uh, you know, less money for them, less control for them. No? They'll have more well, of a say in, in this than they have in IMF? Uh, there's there's that. There's also just a lot of money at stake. I mean, for, for the AIIB to start with a $50 billion capitalization is extremely significant. I mean, it's not going to be, you know, 24 months before the thing is, is as big as the, the Asian Development Bank. And, uh, you know, it's just a ton of loot uh, there. Uh, ch ch you know, Chinese-backed investments in Europe, uh, um, you know, uh, Chinese-backed investments in China. Uh, you know, it just becomes a huge source of funding for the, for the ruling class all all over Europe, um, and for for opening up you know ever more trade and and basically corporate racketeering. You know what we call uh, capitalism uh, these days. <laughs> right. So okay. that that's 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 what's in it. That's what's in it for European governments. And and I mean, truly, the U.S. U.S.'s position on this was was essentially absurd. You know. It was isolating the U.S. in, an, in, a, in a globalized investment climate um, in a way that you know, really was thrown back, I mean, like, you know, to, to, to a world of a single superpower where the U.S. could dictate the terms. I mean, that is no longer the world we live in anymore. And if you looked at the rhetoric of the U.S. just six months ago, you know, denouncing uh, Germany for its flirtations with this AIIB, and, and, and look into the rhetoric, you know, of the U.S. about human rights abuses. I, I find it just disgusting, actually, for, for the U.S., um, where every community in America is facing right now, you know, gigantic upheavals over the human rights of abuses of average Americans by the, by the police, you know, spying by the NSA, uh, you know, a totalitarian government with the world's largest police state, you know, to, to be complaining about about China's human rights record, you know, is, right. it takes a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you this then. What is this going to mean for the American people? Because um, uh, I guess if I think back to what Ron Paul uh, said years ago about the end of dollar hegemony, that, you know, it, basically to, to dumb it down, uh, stacks of $100 bills have been substituted for gold bricks basically in central bank vaults all across the world for as you just said 70 years since the end of the second world war and um i guess his warning was once that confidence in the dollar is lost overseas then all those dollars come floating back home and we will see you know a huge amount of inflation because basically they've just been They've been sitting there backing up foreign currencies in foreign government vaults, but that, in other words, as we've been exporting inflation to the world for all these years, it'll be, you know, you and me and our next door neighbor will be the last ones holding the empty bag. I, I think that's a decent analysis, but I, I think it's important to remember that, that that kind of analysis severely compresses time, you know? I mean, you know, we're, we're, the loss of U.S. global dollar hegemony uh, you know, is that going to happen in the next 10 years? 
you know, maybe, but it's going to be a very slow process. At, at, at some point, uh, the U.S. is going to have to get more responsible with its monetary policy. I don't think there's any question about that. Whether that means, you know, that we're going to see all the dollars in the world, uh, you, know, dec dec you know, decline in value and be, be dumped um, as, as banking assets, uh, you know, any time in the next couple of years, I, I seriously doubt it. But you know, I, th I think the, this kind of analysis is, is that right? If, if they yeah. dump the dollar, then the ones that they still have uh, all of a sudden drop in value so rapidly. They're we're kind of have them all blackmailed the same way they have us blackmailed in a sense. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the great tragedies of of the current situation is, I mean, I, I mean, the monetary system has been a disaster ever since John Maynard Keynes and his compatriots you know, met, what was it, 1944 and cobbled together the Britain Woods system. And that was, that was, that was, uh, that was the beginning of, of, of um, you know, a kind of what, what they hoped to be a permanent sort of dollar imperialism in the world. And it's been very costly for Americans. But it's, it's also made, you know, the world, uh, you, you just don't want that kind of world where a single government's uh, money is dominant uh, all over the world. I mean, it gives the U.S. way too much power and uh, allows for the imposition of political relationships that are, that are highly regrettable, creates a tremendous amount of resentment towards the U.S. all over the world. I mean, we really do need a multi-currency world at the very least. The tragedy is, though, that the, dollar, the end of dollar <coughs> supremacy will necessarily mean the rise of some other government currency in the world, you know? And that's also deeply regrettable. I mean... <laughs> It's weird when you look forward to, you look over the next 30 years, I and mean, we're going to see another, you know, uh, struggle in Asia, you know, between, between uh, uh, you know, J Japan and China. I mean, we're going to re reunite, we're going to reignite that whole struggle all over again. Um, this, this is not the way the world was supposed to work out. As far as anybody knew in the 1980s, Japan was going to be the next, uh, you know, the great superpower in, in Asia. I mean, that has not happened. Uh, uh, the rise of China has taken everybody by surprise, you know, by, by any standard. Uh, I think well, Americans are like woefully ignorant about the truth about China today. I mean, and those people who are not ignorant of it, instead of welcoming it, are like condemning uh, China as, 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 you know, the, the great threat to the world, of course. Right. Well, which is not. Now, so isn't it the case that the reason that Japan didn't become the big economic superpower is because they've adopted Keynesian policies all these times, and so you know ever since the 1980s they just keep trying to reinflate their bubbles, and so their economy kind of gets nowhere, just like ours. But then that leads me to the question: assuming that that analysis is right, that all of Japan's lost decades to inflation, inflationary monetary policy, isn't that the same? Isn't the same thing true about China as well? I've read these articles about these massive ghost cities, I mean, and not ghost towns, but ghost metropolises that have been built yeah. by central planners with phony yeah. uh, Beijing printed government money. And, and don't they yeah. have a monetary policy from hell too? And don't they have, uh, you know, uh, a big come up and it's headed their way as far as that goes? Yeah, they, yeah. Two comments about that. I mean, one one is your your extremely astute observation about about Japan. I mean, th th this was one of the world's great macroeconomic errors. That after the recession, and I now I, I can only talk in decades because I don't I don't recall the specifics. But basically, Japan you know was a rising superpower all throughout the 1980s, and then went into the 1990s in a recession and tried to uh, uh, fix <coughs> the economy by by through a zero interest rate policy. I mean, like zeroing out interest rates, you know, thereby breaking the banking system and cartelizing the economy, bailing out its largest industries. I mean, it, it was an amazing test run in Japan of exactly the same policies that the U.S. has pursued since 2008 here. I mean, it's like this, Scott, is, is absolute proof that governments can't learn like anything. Uh, because the U.S. has adopted, you know, like an exact copy of J Japanese economic policy that lost them basically two decades of prosperity, and nobody talks about this in the U.S., but we are, are you know, ourselves entering into, 
lost decades, you know, uh, through through adopting the exact same unworkable policies. I mean, I've never heard any Keynesian explain why it is that they think that somehow these policies are going to work to restore prosperity in the U.S., but they never worked at all in Japan. So that. So and thank you for re reminding me of that. I mean, that's that's a really interesting observation. As for China, you know, I'm a little skeptical of the of the of the gloom and doomers uh, with regard to China. It's true that there are ghost cities. It's true they have loose monetary policy. There's they're running Keynesian rackets all over the place. But you know, you're talking about a, a gigantic country with unbelievable amounts of untapped human potential, uh, mm -hmm. and also. Um, you know, the Chinese are, are fanatic savers. That's, that's the other thing. I mean, you know, super hard workers and, and wild savers, uh, because they've been through such hell, there's a, a, an extreme sort of risk aversion. I mean, like all of China is like what the U.S. became basically in World War II. You know, a, a country of, of people stuffing uh, money and mattresses and, and not spending anything and... Uh, you know, just a gigantic savings rate, and that's just very, very good for prosperity. You know, you have a tremendous amount of entrepreneurship and talent, uh, untapped human uh, potential, and 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 a financial economic uh, ethos alive. You know, all over China, that um, that really suggests that there's not going to be any, at least to my mind, any end to the boom times. It's true that growth is going to, you know, maybe be. Uh, six percent, as opposed to like the twelve or fourteen percent that it probably could be, but I, you know, I mean, you, when you look forward to the future, it's going to be. I mean, the U.S. is on the decline relative to China. I mean, the world is turning, you know, upside down, and I don't think there's going to be end, any end to that. Uh, I think it's about time that Americans recognize this, and I don't think it's going to be bad for America either. You know, I'm not one of these people that's like, oh my God, China's on the rise. What are we going to do? I think yeah, it's no, I think it's overall trade. very very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, more trade. It's one very round good. world and and more wealth for everybody to uh, to pass around. Now we have a question from the audience here. Uh, Martin asks, does the AIIB lend Chinese resources to borrowers buy labor, equipment, and other things from China to build infrastructure? Yeah, I mean it's a China-run, China-centered uh, IMF, just like the U.S. is for uh, the IMF is for for the U.S. and and Europe. I mean the Chinese government makes ma massive contributions. They elicit contributions from governments all around the world. Uh, the central planners use that money to to front money for investments in in Europe and and China and all over the region, not in the U.S. of course. And uh, you know it serves as a kind of a, a, an investment backing and 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 prod uh, and slush fund essentially for for the ruling class. I mean that's that's what it's all about. And China is like super excited about this because it represents an alternative to um, to having to obey the the U.S., uh, which is what happens when you um, when you when you involve the IMF. So the IMF will be cooperating very closely with the AIB. <laughs> of course, but um, the U.S. is not going to necessarily control it. I mean, the dominant controlling force over the AIB is going to be China. And again, this is in contrast to the Asian Development Bank, which is the the Japanese-centered version of the of the same sort of corporate slush fund. Mm -hmm. Well, and the Chinese also have been buying up resources all over the world. Where America sends our Army and Marine Corps, they send guys with briefcases full of cash to try to buy up all kinds of oil uh, resources in China. That's a big part of America's imperial push into, I'm sorry, I said China meant Africa. Big part of America's push into Africa is just trying to keep the Chinese out, right? That's why they broke off South Sudan yeah. from the north, is to prevent the Chinese from building those pipelines and that kind of thing. And I don't know if the security situation really would justify it, but they've also been trying at least to buy up a lot of um, uh, precious metals or whatever other um, mineral resources in Afghanistan and other places in Central Asia. So they seem to those yes. commies sure seem to be beating America at the capitalist game big time. Yeah, you know one of the funny things about 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 Chinese banking and the financial system generally is that uh, China is absolutely in love with precious metals. Um, they far prefer precious metals to to dollars and. Uh, it's not an uncommon thing in China to see, you know, trucks 
with gold moving them from banks to banks to serve as assets. Um, you know, the, the Chinese the Chinese bankers uh, and consumers love it because it's it's an alternative to uh, to to the dollar. You know, uh, so it's a very old fashioned um, uh, uh, sort of financial system in, in in China that you've got there. I mean, one that samples sort of old world um, ethics. Yeah, it's true, it's inflationary, but you know, nothing like the U.S. Not nothing yeah. anywhere close to it. You know, Greg Pallast, the uh, investigative reporter, he's a progressive type, but he actually trained undercover with Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago. He was kind of a commie, and he and he, he went there. He studied under Milton Friedman. He stayed a commie. Well, a progressive, you know, whatever. But um, but so he's a really interesting guy, Pallast, and, and he always told me that what the Americans really always hated about Hugo Chavez wasn't the oil question because Chavez always did business with the Americans, no problem with Shell Oil and their best of buds. The problem was with the government of the United States of America, not America's oil companies. And what he did when he came to power, the first thing he did was he took $20 billion out of the basement of the Federal Reserve and took it home. And then he turned around and he made his own little mini IMF and started making loans to the countries in South America. But instead of doing it like the Americans, where he's an economic hitman and he's really just there to trick you into some usury so that he can run off with all your resources when you default, he really was just giving the countries in the region a good deal and loaning them money and then letting them pay it back at decent interest rates and not using it as an excuse to gangsterize them out of all their resources. And so yeah. he just completely cut the IMF out of Central and South America. Everybody would rather do business with Chavez instead. And that was why they hated him act, so much and wanted to overthrow him from the time he yeah, got in there. It's an act. Of, it's an act of war. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, we've seen this. We've seen this for for a century, right? And the U.S. Uh, is ready to go to war over over economic policy. Uh, you know, all the talk about human rights, even even when it, it it's legitimate concern. You know, certainly in Venezuela, it's certainly true. It was true in Iraq, right? It's true. Hey, in I Russia. just thought of another great question for you. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of talk, uh, sometimes among libertarians, but also not, um, that says that one of the reasons that the Americans have targeted um, uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, uh, the Ayatollah in Iran, uh, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, is that these guys have threatened to start trading their oil in, uh, in terms other than dollars where America's had this kind of pseudo oil standard ever since the end of the gold standard through their deal with the Saudis and OPEC that everybody has to right. trade their, their oil in dollars and that this is one of the big reasons why the Americans always want to go in there and regime change anybody who threatens to denominate their oil sales in euros or gold or anything else. Yeah. And yeah. So, but the question is, and I know that we're talking about politicians, not people with any economic sense necessarily, but to blow $5 trillion on a war to shore up the dollar doesn't sound like a very smart policy to me. But I wonder what you make of all well, that. Well, but, you know, I, th I think what's important to remember here, we, as libertarians, we often talk about the, the government as this kind of exogenous, you know, politically based institution that's making a bunch of stupid decisions and that sort of thing. But, but the, the reality is, <clears throat> is a lot more complicated than that. Uh, the, the government is nothing other than a vessel to uh, to violently express and extend ruling class interests. And by the ruling class, I mean the dominant wealth holders, uh, social social uh, status holders, uh, the, the powerful private interests in society. I mean that's what that's what government is. You know, it's 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 not external to the ruling class. It's 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 the ruling class's tool that it uses to to extend and and um, cartelize its power over the world. So in that in that sense, um, I mean, your comment about about uh, you know bad financial interests or or idiotic you know financial interests on the part of the government is only like partly true in a sense because I mean the U.S. government is in very much an extension of of the dominant wealth holders in, 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 in the U.S. I mean, especially in the investment banking uh, sphere, uh, the, the, the bond dealers for the, that, that the Federal Reserve deals with most directly. I mean, that, 
Th those are the most um, high-powered elements of the ruling class, and they're the ones that have the dominant influence. Th they can tip um, a situation from um, uh, peaceful coexistence into full-scale war. So I don't entirely rule out. <clears throat> I mean, your theory about about you know uh, petrodollars versus you know paper dollars, um, you know, and and uh, the the threat of of other governments using some other currency. It, it sounds like a kind of a wild conspiracy theory, um, and it's very difficult to confirm this kind of stuff. But I mean, if you, if you just understand something about about the nature of power and the nature of money then you can see that there's probably some basis for it. I wouldn't rule it out anyway. Sure. I mean, the U.S. always right. has some other reason for its wars other than like wanting to bring about human rights in the world. I mean, that, that stuff you can kind of like rule out, you know. Yeah, you can forget all about that stuff for sure. All right, well, so now let me ask you about ruling class economic interests when it comes to the firms that are not really part of the military industrial complex. And I know that in fact, really all big business in America is tied up with the Pentagon somehow from Taco Bell to the tube sock and, and toothpaste companies and everybody else. Any, any big corporation has a, a severe interest in getting a, a Pentagon contract. That's the biggest honeypot on the planet right there. However, uh, you know, I've kind of over the years I've heard uh, from people, and I've read some articles here and there, uh, where some of these corporations are really frustrated about the empire, and especially the Iraq War, for example, where uh, you know Coke and Pepsi and Levi's and automakers and and some of these other companies uh, have suffered greatly in their exports because of the hit that Brand USA has taken, especially since uh, the war in Iraq. And how, in fact, I even saw, this is only a little off topic, I saw a preacher on the Sean Hannity show back in like 2005, and he was a missionary who was trying to convert people to Protestant Christianity in Eastern Asia, and he said, and he was pleading with Hannity, we have to stop this, we have to stop this, because everywhere he went, people would say, Jesus? Oh, no, come on. That's the religion of the evil Americans that destroyed Iraq and killed all those people. I don't want anything to do with that. And so, you know, if you can conflate American brand Jesus with Coke and Pepsi and blue jeans and the rest, it all seems like, you know, red, white, and blue means it's a threat. It's not something that people around the world uh, look up to or want to be a part of anymore. And so, obviously, Lockheed will never stop lobbying for war. But what about the rest of American big business that's not, you know, directly tied to the military-industrial complex and the empire? They could have their trade agreements anyway. They don't need an empire to, to have trade deals with Europe and Asia. And so, I wonder, first of all, if you think they hate it, and, and secondly, if they do, uh, why don't they do anything about it since you know, they actually have some power, these billion dollar corporations. Yeah, this is a really complicated uh, topic. One more example, and, one more example. Yeah. Right now the oil companies are getting killed because the price of oil has fallen and Kerry already yeah. bragged about it. The Secretary of State bragged about how we have a deal with the Saudis to keep production high and to not, as usually OPEC would uh, would drop production to keep the price high. But they want to screw Iran and Russia, and I guess probably Venezuela too, but especially Iran and Russia. And so they have a deal with Saudi to keep production high and keep the oil price low. But what about Houston? What about all the giant firms that are fracking in Texas and are, are uh, processing all this shale oil and, uh, and all this very expensive to refine oil in Canada and in Colorado that can't be refined for a profit at 50 bucks a barrel. Uh, yeah. How in the hell does Washington, D.C. screw Houston like this and get away with it? I, you know, I just don't believe that, that the price of oil, as you see it today, is an, an intended result of anybody's policies. I think you've got a situation here where technology has, has, has boomed through, through fracking. You've got uh, governments at each other's throats over it. Everybody has an interest in, in, in uh, drilling 
and a mining as much as possible. People are trying to grab every last little bit of profit, and it's just driving the price price down and down and down. And I, I don't think there's any oil in the company in in the world or any government in the world that actually welcomes the price of oil, which is one of the reasons I'm so completely delighted by it. I mean, <clears throat> for me, like I have to tell you, over the last year, <clears throat> one of the many sources of joy in my life, um, apart from the jalapeno burger at McDonald's um, and and a few other nice consumer products, has been the falling price of oil. I mean, it's it's just been so fun to to look at and. Yeah, I'm sorry about the profitability of, of Houston and you know and the Bush family, but but in the end, I mean I think the falling price, the, the the collapse in the price of oil has just been fun and and delightful. Uh, and I also yeah, love to see the envir environmentalists suffering, uh, you know, a, such a major setback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a silver lining. But now, but wouldn't typically wouldn't the Saudis uh, ramp down production? And, and try their best to prop the price back up. Yeah. They don't seem yeah, to be doing they, it. Well, they they would if if they could depend on on other countries and other oil companies around the world cooperating and doing the same, right? But this is this is why competition is actually important uh, because you can't create a cartel. There are too many private producers in the world, and and they're in, in a in a kind of a spiraling down race. To extract every little bit of uh, profit they can from whatever uh, uh, oil boom there is in the, in the world. So, yeah, there might be an attempt to restrict them, but we saw this in the 70s. I mean, the, the oil cartels, you know, they can, they can try to restrict production, but there's always cheating that takes place. And so, if you don't trust people, then you know, uh, you know, it's a prisoner's dilemma situation. People are going to defect, and defecting in this case just means drilling more, refining more, shipping more, exporting more. Um, so I, I don't think there's going to be any stop to it. I mean, for the last 12 months, I've been hearing so many people say, "Oh, the price, of, the price of oil is only temporarily low. It's on its way up. It's on its way up. It keeps going down and down and down. It's just, it's just been, just fantastic. It's, in fact, what you're seeing now is governments trying to raise taxes on oil. Have you noticed this? That there's these big movements to try to increase taxes on oil, because, because, because oh, no, the, the entire yeah. ruling right. class is panicked about the collapse of the price of oil, and it's also so funny to me because it was like 10 years ago that there was some sort of like right-wing scaremongering, you know, hysteria about peak oil. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, uh, what happened to that? You know? <laughs> yeah, peak oil at this price, but just wait. But now, so, but then again, now, now the shale oil, some of this, some of this heavier oil, at least now, and, and maybe the technology, I guess, is, is always improving. But um, my understanding was that uh, the, the, the heavy oil in the Canadian tar sands and all that, it's really not profitable to produce at less than 50 bucks a barrel, as opposed to, yeah. say, Saudi sweet crude that sits, you know, six inches under the sand and is ready to pump right into your tank when it comes out. That's true. I mean, this is the reason why people say this is a temporary glut. And, you know, I'm not in a position to say either, either way. But we have seen a fundamental change. Frac fracking represented a fundamental shift in the way we dig for oil and where we get it from. Did you know, actually, uh, I'm just going to mention a kind of a, a, f a very interesting uh, sidelight in libertarian uh, literary history, that if you pick up Atlas Shrugged, if you have an electronic version, and, and search for the term shale, uh, that there's a passage in there in which um, uh, somebody, I, I don't know if it's Reardon or, or somebody, is speculating about about a future in which we're going to have the technology to to drill sideways and, and grab all this oil that's up to now have been inaccessible. This is 19 what? Wow. 1954, something like that. 1957. Right up now, with, right? Well, let's get back to the first. She's a let's prophet. get back to the first part of my question though about uh, Coke and Pepsi <laughs> and Levi's and Jesus and exports yes. of, of brand USA and, and, and the pain that all these non-MIC firms are suffering because of the bad PR from all the blood of the empire. Okay, um, you know, so we've talked tonight a lot about the ruling class. We have to remember that their interests are not homogeneous. Uh, war is mostly not in the, ruling, in the interest of the ruling class with the exception of a handful of military contractors and that sort of thing, but the corporate class actually prefers a peaceful environment so uh, for, for doing business. So to that extent, you know, that division of the ruling class is actually a, you know, a, a benefit. 
Um, but but I, I think what, what, what we have to understand here uh, uh, about the relationship between business and, and government is uh, that it's, it's complex and, and, and ever, ever changing. Um, essentially, governments in the world today, and this has been true for 6,000 years, don't want any capitalistic enterprise to become big and mighty and influential in a way that's, doesn't, uh, that's not ultimately deferential um, to the governments that rule them. You know, so uh, governments use every tactic they possibly can to roll in any large-scale enterprise into the apparatus of power and control. Uh, those businesses typically resent it and resist it for as long as possible. But when they're faced with a situation of uh, uh, regulatory crackdown, um, you know, exposés, uh, you know, antitrust regulations, you know, high taxes. Per Prosecution, persecution by by the central state. Almost every large scale business will choose, to some extent, and an, a relationship of of being allies with the state rather than antagonists. You know, um, you only need to look at at the fate of Microsoft and Google in our own time. I mean, two businesses that started out with with a kind of revolutionary, almost anarchistic spirit. No lobbyists in Washington. You know, anxious to just build a world of free enterprise, global companies, not national companies, um, that were eventually both companies brought to their knees by the threat of regulatory intervention. In the case of Microsoft, it was 10 years of persecution over something as stupid and idiotic as the fact that Microsoft was wanting to give away its browser. In the case of Google, um, you know, a company that's that started its its company slogan as uh, "Do Do No Evil," right? Is now involved in doing evil every single day, uh, you know, and 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 I'm sympathetic to Google in a way, um, but but this is the way the world works. I mean, you cannot be Google unless you're you're uh, unless unless you've you've become part. You're willing to defer to the interests of the ruling class and ultimately serve uh, the interests of the state, which is one of the reasons antiwar.com's uh, ad Google ad campaign was cut out by the way. But this is the way it works. It's a complicated relationship. Um, and there's there's always work yeah, to do a great on the part of the state. Yeah. yeah. I guess a great example would be all the tech firms um, and, and all their suffering since the Snowden revelations that yeah. um, now hardware and software, Google, Yahoo, and Facebook, and everybody that uh, all around the world these guys are, are losing customers, losing billions of dollars because of the, the truth that came out in the Snowden documents about their participation with the state. But yeah, again, it's very, very embarrassing. It? Yeah, it's very yeah. embarrassing. You know, I think, I think if you, you want to look at the great struggle between liberty and, and power in the sweep of history, a lot of it has to do with the pace of innovation. If it's slow, then new members into the ruling class apparatus, you know, that can be can sort of grad, gradually be rolled in in a way that doesn't threaten the incumbent power of large scale bondholders, investment banks, and and the ruling class generally. But if the if the pace of investment goes too quickly, as it's doing right now, you get a situation when liberty actually outruns the capacity of the of the ruling class to roll these uh, these new corporate interests into its power structure. And that's what I find most interesting right now. And I, I, I don't know what it's going to mean. It's, it's one of the most depressing things of our time to see once great companies like Facebook and Google and Microsoft, and, and you can go through the list of them, uh, you know, you know, basically sell out, you know? I mean, but what are you going to, what are you going to do? I mean, you, you either sell out or you die, right? That's, that's the situation the state puts you in. Um, but you know we don't know what's, what kind of businesses are going to start in the future, um, especially with distributed style uh, technology and peer-to-peer -peer relationships. But you, what you have, this is the importance of not having a, a central point of failure, right? So things like Bitcoin are extremely important. Um, uh, Open Bazaar, these kinds of technologies, uh, these peer-to-peer -peer, uh, technologies, because if there's nothing. Uh, for the government to stop and nobody to talk to, no CEO that they can, you know, blackmail and bribe and bring to his knees, uh, you have a kind of a form of guerrilla capitalism taking place, you know? Right. And, and the state can't stop uh, guerrilla tactics, uh, 
you know, when they emanate from the capitalistic sector of life. That's what's going to be most interesting going forward. All right, now, you mentioned antiwar.com and Google, and so for people who aren't familiar, Google AdWords has, um, or is it AdSense, whichever one it is that posts the ads up on antiwar.com, they pulled off all their ads from antiwar.com under the excuse that we've got pictures of the Abu Ghraib torture and pictures of Ukrainians massacred, massacred by the American coup d'etat junta there in Kiev. And they've said, well, now... Uh, you're not allowed to uh, have Google ads there anymore. And um, uh, there's, if you go to antiwar.com and look at the blog, in fact, Tech Dirt today has, has a piece um, about it. There's one at Gawker about it too. But I wanted to mention real quick, um, Daniel was saying right before we went on, Jeff, um, about Bitcoins, not bombs, are having a yeah. contest for uh, antiwar memes. A little, little bit of housekeeping here. Um, uh, at Bitcoin Not Bombs, it's a meme contest, and they got all kinds of great prizes, including Bitcoins and silver and all kinds of things. So if people want to participate in that, they're just looking for peaceful memes. And whoever can come up with the most creative peaceful memes uh, win great prizes, and uh, it's all to help support antiwar.com and figure out a way around this Google blockade. Because this is, uh, I think Eric said, this is about a fifth of our revenue. At antiwar.com yeah. um, comes from those. It's extremely ones. important. So it's really um, important. I am I right that that antiwar.com has seen a lot of support uh, across the political spectrum. I mean, was that an illusion? Yeah. Did I just dream this? Yeah. No. Um. Yeah. I, people are pretty outraged by this because you know Google is such a huge presence in internet life that you know they. They might as well be government in a sense if they decide that, um, you know, they the way Eric says it is they are trying to dictate our content to us. They what they said was, uh, you know, your, your rule of thumb should be if it's OK to show it to a child, then it's OK to run. Well, you know what? This is antiwar.com and it's for grownups. And we're covering mass murder by our government that tortures and murders people. And no, that's not okay for kids necessarily, depending on the kid, I guess, and the, and the age. But uh, that is not a fair rule of thumb for how antiwar.com has to do business. And now, of course, they're not the government, and we are not bound to have to use Google Ads. But on the other hand, we're going to take a severe hit by not using Google Ads. So they are, in a, in a very real sense, trying to coerce us and dictate our content to us of what's allowable and what's not. And so and, um, and, and they've I done think this a lot of people it. understand that and are, are really rebelling against it. I know Eric has been interviewed on every Pacifica station in America over the last week about it. And um, sure. uh, there are all kinds of websites. Gawker covered it, which is a huge website. Tech Dirt and others are, are getting onto this because... They see the threat, what's going on here. As you said, their slogan was don't be evil, but now they're completely and totally intertwined with the state. There's no way around it. They have to be evil or they can't be Google anymore. And so now, you know how it is, S rolls downhill. And, and so now it's rolling on to us. Yeah, and you know, you know I, I mean, for, for anybody listening to this, it's, uh, let me just add one quick note of caution here. It's, it's very easy to 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 blame to put all the blame on, on Google and say, oh, isn't it terrible what this company is doing? But but uh, I I do think it's important for us to keep, maintain perspective here. I think that that in a in a stateless world, Google could have forever upheld its slogan, "Don't be evil," you know. Sure. But but in a world where that where of the total state, um, when basically your your survival depends on your cooperation with the political masters. Um, it creates a very difficult situation for any private enterprise. Right. So I, I, I just, at, I just want to offer that. Right now, in fact, there's, there's a court ruling, and, and they're still appealing it, so it's not final yet. Right. But there's a court ruling that says that the government must release more than 2,000 more torture pictures. And I think that this is what is kind of behind this push, is that Interesting. they want... Google to basically kind of preemptively punish anybody who would be willing and ready and able to publish those pictures, which of course antiwar.com will do. That is really fascinating. Well, thank goodness we have the opportunity to, to get outside of the system. It's not easy, 
Um, but uh, I, I have to congratulate you know Eric and and the whole antiwar.com team for for the way you've handled this. It's gotten a lot of attention, and hopefully, if everything goes well, uh, you know you'd be better off at the at the end of the day. Uh, and I think that would just yeah. be amazing. Uh, you know, it's it's again, it's it's a tragedy in a way for me because I I saw yeah I mean the first time I ever heard about Google is somebody sent me a link. I think it was somebody who worked at the Institute for Humane Studies and said and shot me a link on email and said, um, wow, you're going to love this new search engine. And my first thought was, this company is never going to go anywhere with a name like that. That's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. But, yeah, you know, I've watched oh, the yeah, rise. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's it's been a beautiful thing. And I'd say the same thing about Facebook. I'm a big celebrator of these of these new technology. And and these these institutions, I congratulate the CEOs. I read the the book by um, by the CEO of Google, and I I loved. He has a passage in there. He says, you know, talks about the internet as being the world's first great global experiment in anarchy. You know, so you've got uh, people with their hearts in the, exactly in the right place. You know, but you know, in 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 a, in a world with as so long as there's states, especially you know, gigantic, powerful, uh, well-funded uh, imperial states like the U.S. Um, every everybody's in a in a difficult situation. I mean, Google did not crawl to the NSA and ask for permission for them to put a back door. You know, I mean, that was not the situation. Google's not been lobbying for for corporate favors. I mean, they're they're not so much the bad guys here. They're just they're rolled into a ruling class apparatus uh, just by necessity. And uh, I think it's really tragic. And that's why I think. We should be happy about the emergence of a new form of capitalism in the 21st century that's basically peer-to-peer, -peer, more and more so. And, and there's fewer central points of failure uh, because of the state, as I say, if the state can't march into the, into the boardrooms and say, give us access, or, you know, obey us or we're going to kill you. If they can't do that, if there's no boardroom, if there's no CEO, um, uh, then, then it, it becomes much more difficult for the, for the governments to, to rule the world. I mean, I say this just because too many people on the left, especially, are too quick, I think, to, to blame um, the corporate, corporate elites. I mean, there's, there's certainly a, a lot of responsibility to go around. But in the end, the real bad guy here is the state. It's a good thing to, to remember. Yep. And speaking of which, we have another question here. And I kind of was hoping that we could get to this a little bit tonight. we got about 10 minutes yep. left. I, I try not to go on too, too long, although I should never... No, no, everybody that, needs to know... You, you know everything about this topic, and everybody needs to, well, to hear no. what you have to say about it. <laughs> I, I, I know enough to, to explain just how confusing and ridiculous it all is, I think. The, the question is, is ISIS Obama's version of Bush's weapons of mass destruction? And uh, I think short answer is yes. ISIS is the excuse for America to get back into Iraq. The Pentagon's view is that they stole Iraq fair and square. They got a million people killed so that they could own that place forever and cover it with their lily pad bases. And uh, they're not over it. And, and they want back in. And ISIS is a great excuse to do so. Um, but, you know, what's funny about the whole thing is if, uh, and I don't know how familiar people are with this kind of thing, you might... Maybe everybody pull up another window and, and go look at a map of the Sunni and Shia in the Middle East. And the, the Shiites are a very small minority of Muslims in the world, but it's about a 50-50 split in the Middle East. And uh, what you have, the Shiite side is basically the Iranians and their government. Baghdad, now under the control of the Shiites ever since the American War of 2003 through 11. And then their allies in Damascus, in Syria, and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. That's what the, the Sunni kings call the Shiite crescent. And it's now, I don't know, a hundred times more influential in the region than it was because of America's last Iraq war. Because, basically, because the Iranians fooled a bunch of Israel first or neocons into believing that if they got rid of Saddam Hussein, it would be good for Israel. 
and they would get a modern, secular, democracy, Western-style nation-state that would build a pipeline, an a oil and water pipeline to Haifa, and would get along with Israel forevermore. And in fact, Ahmed Chalabi, who was the, the leader of the exiles who sold all the lies about the weapons of mass destruction to, well, most of the population through the New York Times, etc., they were working for the Iranians all along. Ahmed Chalabi was working for the Iranians. And it was pretty obvious, if you think about it, when Bush called Iraq and Iran an axis of evil, all of us were saying, what? I thought your father and, and Ronald Reagan backed Saddam against Iran, and then Iran against Saddam, too, back in the 1980s. So what do you mean they're an axis together? together? They were mortal enemies. And what America did was they... They got rid of Saddam, who ruled a 20% minority dictatorship of Sunnis over the 60% majority Shiites. And then so right. once America invaded, the Shiites demanded one man, one vote. You said democracy. We want one man, one vote. And so that was it. They got their democracy. They got the, uh, the worst of the Shiite parties, the Iranian-backed Shiite parties, were the ones who came to power. And Americans... Uh, lost, we lost 5,000 Americans fighting a war where literally the Americans were the sock puppets of the Iranians. The Army and the Marine Corps were the auxiliaries of the Shiite militias, even where it sort of looked like the Shiite militias were the auxiliaries of the American Army. It was the other way around. So now that these idiots went and ruined everything for themselves, and the, the victors said, thanks very much for giving us Baghdad. Now get the hell out and kick us out. They've been trying to figure out a way to get back in. And while on one hand they're working with the Iranians uh, to, to try to resolve the fake nuclear issues so that we can uh, you know, have, end the Cold War with Iran. Here, you know, Bush considered Iran as mortal en America's mortal enemy while he's fighting for them. Now Obama wants to end the Cold War with them by putting the nuclear issue to bed while he's fighting against them by backing the Sunni insurgents in Syria to help undermine Iran's ally Bashar al-Assad. And of course what he's doing instead really is empowering, he's, he's empowered um, in effect the Islamic State and al-Nusra, which is al-Qaeda in Syria, the Sunni extremists, the bin Ladenites in Syria. And has also, I think, inadvertently empowered Hezbollah from southern Lebanon that has come to Syria to help the uh, Shiite government fight. And so you, you literally have an Islamic state now that has erased the border between Iraq and Syria. And they claim this land in all of western Iraq and eastern Syria. And you have America fighting for Iran and the Shiites in the east and for the Sunnis and Al-Qaeda in the west. In the same damn war. And uh, it, it seems to make no sense, but the key is that's what Israel wants. And that's what our other allies, the Saudis, the Turks, and the Qataris want as well, and the Jordanians for that matter. They hate Bashar al-Assad and they hate Iran, and so they want to limit his influence there. But now, and I'm an anarchist, I'm not even a minarchist, uh, or anything, but you kind of sort of have to concede that this is high treason, that Barack Obama and his administration have been backing al-Qaeda in Syria. And now I'll be the first to tell you that America has no enemy nation state on this planet. Really, not even ISIS is our enemy. They've never attacked us. Our only real enemy in the world is al-Qaeda, and they're not much of one. They're not a government. They're just a, a militia, really, and, and a band of pirates. Um, but Barack, where George Bush gave Western Iraq to the bin Ladenites accidentally with his stupidity by invading Iraq in 03, Obama has outright taken their side in Libya and in Syria. And he has, he has turned, uh, he was almost telling the truth, Jeff, in 2011 after bin Laden was killed and he said that the war is pretty much over, we whooped al-Qaeda and we're pretty much done. Then he turned right around and he backed the bad guys uh, in Libya and in Syria. And he led to their, to their rise and their spread throughout North Africa and the Middle East. And as far as, you know, the empire as a perpetual motion machine, the, the questioner, Andrew, is right. I mean, this is, ISIS is now the excuse 
where the the caliph Ibrahim is basically just Osama bin Laden incarnate himself there, now standing on the balcony like Mussolini, declaring himself the leader of all Sunnis and the leader of the caliphate. And so this war can now go on for another generation. And another 25 years, another 25 years of, of war. You know, every time you every time you say the word uh, Bush, uh, you know that my my memory goes back to the the elder president, right? Um, right. The, the, the first invasion. The yeah, yeah. The first invasion I think occurred in like, am I right? Like 90, 91, 92, something right. like that. Right. 91. Uh, yeah, and and that was the theory of of the first invasion was that we just have to get rid of this thuggy thuggy guy, and and then and then we can have a beautiful democratic system uh, that will replicate, you know, um, in 19th century America. Uh, that that was that was the view back then. And, but even in those days, despite the naivety of of the U.S. war planners and especially the civilian new government that went in after. Uh, you know the thing was routed um, the first time. Uh, you know it, it, the naivety was just absolutely shocking, and and even back then people were warning. I mean, 25 years ago, were warning that this is going to lead to the rise of uh, of Shiite power all over the region and ignite a kind of a new form of uh, Islamic fundamentalism that we've never seen never seen before. Right. Yeah, in fact, I can never find this footnote anymore. I think it must be in a Chalmers Johnson book somewhere. But um, Lloyd Benson, who was Mondale's vice presidential candidate in 1984, the uh, yellow dog Democrat or blue dog, whatever kind of conservative Democrat you call him, uh, he is old Texas oil man, and he warned Bush Sr. He said, don't put the troops in Saudi Arabia. Man, you're going to drive the crazies crazy. And this was, of course, the leading cause of uh, Al Qaeda yeah. terrorist, the Al Qaeda war against the United States all through the 1990s and up yeah. to September so, 11th was American so to really Christian you, white combat forces on the Holy Peninsula. So you have to go back 35 years essentially to understand this uh, fully, in other words, right? Yeah. And and so and as you say, another another 25 you can go years. Back from, yeah, I mean, why did they back Saddam Hussein against Iran? Because the Iranians had overthrown the American sock puppet dictator in 79 that America had installed in 53. And so they said, oh, no, we have to contain the Shiite revolution in Iran by backing Saddam against it. Got a million people killed in that war in the 80s, the Iran-Iraq war. A million people died, about half on each side. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, uh, believe it or not, I actually remember that. Uh, as incredible as that may seem. So now we're we're talking about you know um, uh, you, you mentioned what what 1954 so you know so we're talking about 60 yeah. years ago now 53 so mm -hmm. we're talking about 60 60 62 years ago now so you know what an amazing history of of folly um, listen I am not so exuberant about the possibility for any serious change with Obama out of office. Uh, or, 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 in other words, change towards the good, right? I mean, right. I, you know, I look at I look at the current crop of, of of Republicans who are running, and it it's absolutely terrifying to me uh, to to see, uh, in a weird sense, the the sort of imperialist military ethos alive in the Republican Party, even after all of these years at the end of the Cold War. The 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 uh, the isolationist the the, the the pro peace element of the Republican Party is is strikes me as preciously small and insignificant. What's your sense of that? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And um, you know, I've been, I guess, getting in trouble with uh, some libertarians ever since 2009 when I first interviewed Rand Paul. And in that very first interview, he said he didn't want to get out of Afghanistan. He didn't want to close Guantanamo Bay. He didn't want to see the Bush administration prosecuted for torturing people to death. And I could just tell immediately, I see this guy's game. He's going to move to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right, to try to suck up. And, of course, they'll never let him have the power because of his last name. But he doesn't know that. And he's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse the closer he gets, he thinks, to a chance 
at power. And now we see him outright, you know, signing on to the Tom Cotton letter, trying to undermine the nuclear talks with Iran and, um, and, you know, quite a few other horrible foreign policies. Uh, he came out in favor of sanctions against Russia last year. And, um, and, and there's a million more of them. And, and some people get mad at me, but then they come back a couple years later and say, well, I guess you were right about him. And, and he's all we got. Ron is gone. Yeah, and he may be the best among the Republicans, uh, you know, even yeah, so. Yeah, no doubt about it, but he's horrible. You know, but and, you know, I, 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 I have this weird sense that no matter what happens in the next presidential election, I just, I remember this all too well when, when, when Clinton, the Clinton, for, for some reason, I, I loathe Clinton. I don't even remember now why. Because when Bush came into power, you know, I looked back and I thought, holy shit, you know, we had some good years there with that guy, Clinton, you know, and I, I, my, <laughs> yeah, my biggest like fear, comes. yeah, is that this is going to be our future, like, like in, in five years from now, we're going to look back and go, God, we had no idea how good we had it under Obama. Yeah, I'm afraid that that's true. I think that, <laughs> I think that whether it's Hillary or Jeb next, I think that we're going to wish it was Obama who, after all, backed down on the war against Assad in 2013 um who who has has been reluctant to put in ground troops in large numbers in iraq and libya and other places where he could have and and uh, that ain't no apology for him right he's he's murdered people in afghanistan pakistan yemen somalia libya syria uh and iraq and uh which is at least you know in terms of of raw numbers of countries attacked is, is far more than george w bush ever did uh, he's murdered American citizens with drones and and gladly and happily admitted that he did so um, under no even pretended authority, really. Uh, and he's been, uh, you know, as far as NSA spying and uh, extraordinary rendition to torture states and these things, he's just been absolutely horrible. But uh, I don't see any progress on the horizon. I mean, I think Marco nope. Rubio is probably the, the perfect example of of what is a Republican in 2015, some loudmouth, yeah. know-nothing idiot who just absolutely doesn't know the first thing about anything and yet would never let that hold him back from making a bad decision, you know? <laughs> That's the best description of Republicans I've ever heard. So to bring it all the way back around, this is why I'm not regretting the rise of China. I think, I think a world in which that's, that's not just one superpower with one currency, uh, uh, you know, is is probably a good thing. So, uh, yeah, people tell me absolutely. about this ter- terrifying rise of China. I'm 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 cheering. Uh, I'm not moving yet, but um, I'm I'm not sad about it. Well, you know, we're out of time, uh, Scott. It's it's been an absolute delight to talk to you tonight. Thank you so much. And I think you and I have talked about doing this actually more regularly rather than once a month. Yeah. And I really like that idea. Yeah, good. Let's do it uh, maybe every two weeks. I'm up with that. I really like I really like this. I learn so much every time I talk to you. Thank you, my friend. Great. Yeah, no, this has been great. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thank friend, you. Uh, if you're not a member of Liberty.me, join up. Uh, it's a good time to join. Uh, you join the world, the global liberty community. Uh, liberty is coming, and you can be part of it. Take care. Thanks, Dan. Night, night. Good night.